Well, hello there and welcome uh, to this tutorial video which will be all about playing arpeggios on one of these, a DG Melodeon or if you want to be formal, uh, a diatonic accordion. Um, now arpeggios are very common in a great deal of music and certainly if you look at many traditional tunes um, you will find them as an integral part of what they're made of. Um, certainly in tunes from England and Scotland and Ireland there's loads of arpeggios there within and even in cases where there's not you can still use arpeggios to introduce variations or perhaps ornamentation. Um, it's all good. So this video will have two main parts. Um, the first will be quite simple. Um, a quick introduction to what arpeggios are and um, then a demonstration of some of the more common one octave arpeggios that you can play on a melodium. Um, the second part will be all about playing two octave arpeggios and that's quite a bit more difficult to do um, but I've not seen that mentioned much anywhere else so it seemed a good idea to put it on a video. After that, if I'm feeling generous, maybe I'll add um, one or two bonus sections on the end too. You'll have to wait and see for that. So, um, before I start, I would like to say that this video is very much um, a partner video for the one I did previously about um, chord straddling. Both videos basically about what you can do on your treble end um, if you take a chord and break it up a little bit so they're both very similar really so if you've not seen that one perhaps that's worth checking out as well if you've enjoyed this one so okay um time to get on with it so when i first started learning about music um some while back now um I was taught that if you take a basic three note chord, um, say G major, we'll do here a G, a B, and a D, and you play those together, well, that's the chord, but if you were to play them individually, ascending, going up, or descending, going down, or perhaps up and then down, that's then known as, well, a broken chord is what I was told. Um, so, that's what I was told anyway. Later, I was then told that if you added a one extra note, the a repeat of the root note but in the upper octave, on top of that, that's what an arpeggio is. So, in this instance, with the G chord again, it's going to sound like... And then the last upper octave G... And, well, yeah, that's what an arpeggio is. Except that I've since learned that not everyone uses that um, terminology and some people use arpeggio to mean a three note one or a four note one or anything remotely similar, really. So um, it's your choice of what you choose arpeggio to mean to some extent, I think. Um, for this video I won't talk much about um, the three note ones as you can probably figure that one out yourselves very easily if you know anything at all about the four note ones so we'll stick with that for now. So what can we do on here? Well we've already done the first one, G major. When playing those you got to get the notes right but it's also worth remembering to keep the timing under control and constant and also uh, perhaps keeping the uh, the volume constant as well or perhaps you could give a little bit of a nudge onto the first note and something like that so as to give a bit of rhythm to it you're quite uh, in your rights to do that that seems a good plan as for what other 
chords we can do, what other arpeggio, arpeggios, well if we can do G major in the bottom octave we only have to shift our hand and go up to the top octave notice I'm using all four fingers here and just doing that really so here's the lower one here's the upper octave one So that's two we've got already. Um, the same thing you can do on the outer row, the D row in this case, and that will obviously give you a D major arpeggio going up and down. And again, you can do that in the upper octave. So now we've got four very easily just by going along on adjacent buttons with adjacent fingers. Um, also along one row, we've got some minor um, arpeggios available. So on the outer row, let's start with that one this time. We can do E major, E, no, E minor. Obviously a very common chord on these instruments. So that's much the same. This time we're all on the pull. Previously everything was pushing, now we're all just pulling. And it's pretty much the same thing, except that we've got a gap up between the third and the fourth note. So we're going to miss out one of the buttons. And if you saw the previous video, that will seem familiar to you from there as well. So it's going to be like this. So E. So yeah, E, G, B, and then back to E. And again with that one we can do exactly the same thing with the same fingerings and the same gap in the upper octave. So we start here. And indeed we can do the same, much the same thing on the inner row and that's going to give us an A minor chord or A minor arpeggio. The same thing, we've got a gap again between the third and fourth notes. But we can't do that one in the um, upper octave, at least not on this instrument and not on most instruments because they don't have that um, upper um, A, at least on the, on the pull. Um, find out how to do that a bit later on, but just doing what the same pattern. We're missing one, we haven't got a note there. So we're a bit stuffed on that one, at least for now. Um, yep, yeah, so that's a whole load. I think that's well, how many we've got now. We must have seven arpeggios just going up and down the, the rows. Um, to get much further, you need to start, well, either crossing the rows, so I suppose we'll start with that, um, or changing bellows direction. So for the crossing the rows, we could have B minor. That's a very good example of one we can do. And so, we can start off and the B, we're going to push this one and we're going to start off in the inner row with the B note there. Then we go in the outer row for the next two and you can see that. And then back on the inner row for the B at the end. And it so happens that we can do that one again, an octave above and exactly the same pattern. And maybe, and that's just, this depends on your instrument really, if you've got um, low notes set up in some formation or other, it's quite likely you've got a low B available. And if you've got that one, then we can do the whole thing in, in, in the lower octave too. So um, that's going to be... Um, and again, it's exactly the same finger pattern. It all works out. So that's three that you get very easily. Um, and so that's one way of crossing the rows to get more arpeggios. And then one more I'll show you is A major. We did A minor earlier, which was um, just along the row. At least that's what we did. Um, a major, um, well, if we try to do A major just in one bellows direction, we can certainly do that in the um, middle octave. So we'll start there on the inner A and then we go onto the outside. It's a bit of a stretch this, but we need to go right onto the outside to, to the C sharp there. 
And stay on the outside to the E on the next one. And then finally the A on the inside to finish up. So we can do that all on the pull. Like that. Now, it is also possible to do an A major um, in the lower octave, again on the, all on the pull, but only if your instrument is set up with the right lower notes. So this one is, um, so on here, uh, we can do, um, that's the one. We've still got to go inside on the last one there if we're going to do it all on the pull. So. Don't usually do that one, but it, it's definitely there. Um, however, if you don't have that lower one, there are options, there are things we can do. Um, because you happen to have a push A as well as the pull A on your outer row, and so if you were to use that push A at the bottom, which is that one, and then you pull it out to get the C sharp, it's actually on the same button. Or you could go and then push the top one. In fact, you can do the middle, um, the middle octave one, again on A major, entirely on the outer row by pushing and pulling. So start there on the push. And you even have the very high octave somewhere. Where is that? Thought it was there somewhere. So we've got a push there. Then we've got a gap and then two pulls on the very top two and then push on the highest one. And earlier we said that we couldn't do A minor in the higher octave, but actually that was wrong because we could have used that pushing A there instead. So we could, let's have a go at that. Where are we? There's the A. So we did have that one after all, but you do have to have a change of bellows. Um, when it comes to changing bellows and arpeggios, sometimes you've got to do it if you want the notes and they're not available just in one direction. Uh, but overall, if you can do it in one direction, you're probably going to get a smoother, um, more satisfying result really. Um, depends on the type of music you're playing and what you want, but for an arpeggio it tends to be one sort of whole thing uh, that you don't want to break up, but that's up to you really. Depends on what style you're going for. So yep, yeah, that's the first stage. That's um, some of the basic one octave um, arpeggios that we can get on a melodium. And so now to part two, and this is where things get um, rather more tricky. This is going to be about playing two octave arpeggios. Now we know from the previous section that um, for some chords and arpeggios, we actually have arpeggios available in, in different octaves. But the problem is, is how you link them together. If you were to use the fingering that we used before, say on G major, um, we'd just go uh, something like this. And when we get to that end note, if we're playing that with our little finger, it's kind of hard to know what to do there because you want to keep on going up, but what finger do you use? Because none of them are really available. Uh, bouncing your little finger along the buttons, you can do that, but it's not an ideal thing. It's It's not... It's not something you really want to do unless you there really is no other way of doing it. Um, you could go use the first three like the same and then do a jump with your index finger onto the next one. That's better, but if you're jumping a long way with one finger, that's when errors are going to come in. That's when you're going to hit the wrong note as I actually just did then, um, just for demonstration purposes you understand. Um, 
you don't really want to be jumping it's sort of a big leap of faith around the keyboard and that's kind of awkward so that's not ideal either so what can you do if you don't do either of those well with a two row melodeon some of the notes are duplicated on both rows and in some cases those duplications are in the same direction and when that happens it seems seems almost a waste in some ways but actually for these arpeggios it comes in very handy because if we use the button that's on the other row that kind of opens our hand up to be able to get to the next buttons um, without doing those jumps so much you can kind of anchor it and move your hand and it all kind of works out with a bit of practice anyway um, so to show what you that what that means in practice I'll, I'll do a G major two octave arpeggio very slowly so we'll start with an index finger on the G um, I should have said earlier this is a fourth button start instrument yours might be third button ignore these if you're not sure anyway start with the index finger on the G that's fine then the next one we have a middle finger on the B the next button up and now what you'd normally do is use your fourth finger on the next button but this time we're not going to do that we're going to use the fourth finger on an outside button on this is a D and we've got an outside D available nearby so we're going to put our finger on that one instead so we're going to and once our fingers there we can swivel our hand so that our index finger comes across to hit the G which is the next note along so there's not such a it's a still a bit of a jump but it's not as bad as just going like that so that's much more natural to me it, it, you can do that without a gap and without such a, a scary jump so once you're there you can carry on going up to the top of the arpeggio when you get back here again you're back with your index finger here that's where you bring your fourth finger underneath to hit that D and then you can finish off as you started out if you practice it you can go very very fast and you don't get a, a, a little gap in the middle um, it's a lot smoother if you do it that way um, I wouldn't say it's easy it takes a while to get used to where the buttons are and what it feels like but if you work at it it does start to come so that's your G major two octave arpeggio next we we'll use a similar technique to do a D major arpeggio now this one is mainly on the outside row but again we, we use that same duplicated D note um, to our advantage and this time we'll use the in, one on the inside row as the, of the, the swivel button if you like so this time we start on the D with our index finger then we go with the um, F sharp with the middle finger and actually we you go with the A on the outside row with the fourth finger as well but this is the one where we now go across with our index finger to get the D that's on the inside so and once we're there we carry on on the outside row again and at the end we could go right up and stay on the outside one or you could if you found it more comfortable go on the inside because there's a D high D there and I kind of prefer that one don't know why just perhaps I'm being odd who would thought it anyway then when you come back down again you go across to get that D on the inside and then bring your fourth finger underneath for the A and finish it off and that way you get a nice smooth two octave arpeggio and again practice it hard you can be whizzing up and down there like crazy and it, it kind of looks impressive if you can do it and not mess it up um, one final one one final two octave arpeggio I'll show you it's E minor now we had that one earlier that one is mainly on the outside row two and in the case of this the actual buttons you use are actually exactly the same as what we did for D major in the lower octave the only difference is we're pulling rather than pushing this time so 
start on the index again and we're going to use your, this index finger to jump across this time to get the E which again is duplicated on the inside now we've got a great big gap to get to the next note the um, G which is a bit awkward and once you get used to playing the D major you want to kind of carry on like that but this is different so and again you can do the either the inside one and that's probably why I like playing the D on the inside one because this is then the same or you can do the outside one but that one's got a gap before you get there it's up to you I prefer the inside so and if you practice it it'll become smooth and you can get it faster and as fast as you need really and certainly that's something you can do as a bit of a sort of a flourish if you like when you're playing and just whiz up and down the keyboard um, like crazy thing if you get used to it if you're swapping between instruments that have different button spacing then you'll start to find problems because you'll get used to one of them when you're doing this and then you go to the other instrument and you start missing um, I guess that's just a penalty for having too many instruments really isn't it Anyway, that's how two octave uh, arpeggios work. There's certainly other ones that you can find and explore. And if you understand these three, then the fingering for others should start to become apparent when you actually think about it. Um, to do some of the others, it kind of depends on the setup of your instrument as well a little bit. Um, certainly we could do uh, a B minor one. Um, and actually that would probably work even on a regular instrument. Um, if we start in the middle one and go right up the top um, but yeah there's lots to explore there but that should be enough to um, get you thinking about it really okay right then uh, I said at the beginning of the video that there might be um, some bonus sections and um, well this is one of those um, this one's going to be about playing three octave arpeggios now before i continue it must be said that your instrument might not be capable of this if you have say a, a 21 button two row instrument and that instrument has been configured so that there are accidental notes on the very end then it's likely that you're not going to have enough notes to be able to play uh, full three octaves um, however if your instrument does have lower notes at the end or perhaps like this one it's got some extra buttons so it can do both then you're in luck because three octaves is going to be available so I'm going to show you here two different three octave arpeggios first is quite simple um, nice and repetitive and that's B minor one so um, basically we can start here on the index finger and this is the, basically the same pattern in all three octaves so this one works out very nicely this is all on the push and so we start here on the bottom bit so yeah so if you note the fingering it's just the index finger the middle finger the fourth finger then I swap the index finger across back onto the inner row to get the next B and then we just repeat it and then I use my middle finger just for this top one so that's three octaves how about that a nice a regular pattern too so that's a bonus so that one's pretty easy really um, the other one we can do certainly on this instrument but even even if you've got low notes it can vary of what those notes are and it might well be that this one wouldn't work for you um, so, but we can do a G major one certainly on this instrument as we have a low G just about here and then we have a B on the inside and then we have, we need a D, we can do it on either side, but for this one it's easier to play the D on the outside. And then we can swap our index finger across to get that G. So we've got that full 
Once we're there, then we can carry on just as if we were playing the um, two octave version really. So again, and then we go on the outside here. So that works for this particular instrument because I've got it set up. So we've got that G right at the bottom there. Even with low notes, sometimes that might be something else. It might well be an F sharp, in which case it's not going to work. But that's the nature of these things. Instruments vary a lot and making a video that covers everything is just basically impossible really. But if you learn your instrument, if you know how it works, you'll be able to figure out what and what what is and what isn't possible. So there we go, three octave arpeggios. Okay then, congratulations, you've made it to the last section. This is the second bonus section, if you like. And um, yeah, I thought I'd do this one just to cover some of the um, odd bits that didn't fit anywhere else. So um, firstly, um, well, previously we did major arpeggios and minor arpeggios, but there are some other variations that could be done also. And one such variation is a seventh type arpeggio. And so I'll show you one of these. There's not too many seventh chords that are possible on a standard two row, but there, there's, well, there's at least one, because I'll show you this now. And this one's going to be an A major, well, dominant seventh and so don't worry if you don't know what that means but you can follow along here and see what that actually means in practice so we're going to do it's much like the a major arpeggio but there's an extra note in there somewhere and for this one i think we'll use just a tiny bit of bellows reversing right at the end although we don't have to so we'll start on a then we go to our c sharp as we did for a major then our e and then we add in a G mate, a G note, like that, before we finish up. So we could finish up on the A again, or we could do it on that row if you like, if we want to keep pulling everything. So it's going to sound like... So yeah, extra note in there as well. So that's a seventh arpeggio. and. If you've got an instrument with some extra buttons and you notice I changed instruments and this one has got extra buttons, you might find that you've got lots more seventh arpeggios to find on your own instrument. So that was the first thing. And um, yeah, talking about these inner buttons, there are some more regular arpeggios, some more majors and minors and so on that are possible. Now we've got these in play. Um, it depends on exactly which notes you've got. Sometimes you have instruments that have got a whole extra third row, and sometimes that's another diatonic row, and sometimes it's a row of just, well, accidentals and odds and ends. Um, and on this one, you have half row, and these are just, again, accidentals really, and, and a couple of reversals on the middle button. Um, the instruments vary a lot, as I've said before, and so you really have to know what your own individual instrument is and what it's got before you can know really how to do this. But one thing I was going to point out is that if you start using these, then your fingering patterns, well, you'll probably find they get very weird and um, convoluted just because the notes don't necessarily fit with the other two rows in terms of which notes are high and which ones are low and how they, they, they fit in with each other. So I'll give you a couple of examples of that. Um, one of them is an F major scale, which I can do on this instrument, as we've got F notes here on the pool. And in fact, the whole thing can be done on the pool. But I'm going to start with this on the F note, which is this one at the end, um, with my middle finger, because even though A is a higher note, it comes this end of the keyboard in relation to the F. So it's going to be, and then I use my index for the next one, which is totally back to front, but that's how it works. And then the next one is adjacent, so that's a C. And then I use my little finger, missing out this finger completely because it's not really in the right place to get the high F. Like that. 
So yeah, it's totally weird. Um, another one we can do on this particular instrument is E major. Now E minor we did earlier and that was all on the row on the outside. E major requires a, uh, a G sharp and that's only available right on the inside here on this instrument. Um, and the fingering here is really weird because I find that it's best using only two fingers for this one just because of the way it sort of fits. So if I do my E and on this again, this is going to be all pull. So we do our E, then we got a G sharp, which is right in the middle. And then we get a B, which again is on the outside. So that's where I use my index finger to bring it under. And then we finish up with the E, which, well, we've got a choice here, but the middle row in this case is probably the easier one. And so on. So that was just two fingers doing that. And, well, if you've got a two and a half or a three year instrument, you're going to have loads to explore with that. And I can only suggest just giving it a bit of an effort, really, because so many instruments vary of how they're set up only you're going to know how your instrument really works however that's all i'm going to say here i've probably gone on more than enough already if you've sat through these bonus sections well done um, i hope you've enjoyed this i hope it's been useful in some way um, i've not seen much about how to play arpeggios on these things written elsewhere or on videos so maybe this is useful to you. If not, well, have a nice day anyway. Cheers for now.